If you look on uh, the verse 41, just about the prayer, I think this is really interesting. It's on page 1020. It says, uh, Seest thou not that it is Allah who praises uh, all beings? Whose praise, whose praises all beings in the heavens. I, I have a problem with these kind of translations. I'm just going to do my own here. Haven't you seen that it is Allah that all beings are praising from the birds in the heavens and the earth? Uh, and even the birds in flying and everything knows its prayer. قَدْ عَلِمَ صَلَاتَهُ كُلٌّ قَدْ عَلِمَ صَلَاتَهُ وَتَسْبِيحَهُ Every creature knows his prayer and his praise. So this is really interesting in the idea that every creature is in an act of worship and it knows how to do that. The bird knows how it's supposed to praise. Right? And so for the Muslims, when they look at, at creatures, they really see that these creatures are all glorifying God and have a prayer that they're doing. So, you know, the praying mantis has its prayer. The cat has its prayer. I mean, you can see the cat in a state of meditation, you know, when it's there just purring away and, and doing, I mean, it goes into a, a really interesting state. And in fact, Zen Buddhists, you know, traditionally talk about the cat and its meditative state. It, it, you know, that you can learn Zen from a cat. If you want to learn how to do sazen, you watch a cat. And then that, uh, that the human being is somebody who does, does, does not, by nature, know his prayer. That the prayer is something that is taught. And this relates because the, the human being is a creature uh, that has intellect, that has consciousness, that it is not inspired, uh, or there is not an intuitive. Although many people will feel some type of a desire to pray and will pray and many people even outside of traditions in this culture at some time in their life will attempt to pray for the Muslim point of view you know there is a way of praying and that way involves the body and there is an importance uh, of the idea of being in the body when one prays because the Muslims have always uh, really avoided a, a type of Cartesian dualism of mind body and we believe in the bodily resurrection Although we do see that the soul is, is connected to the body and the soul does disengage from the body. And in fact, the Muslims believe, according to the Quran, that the soul even disengages during sleep. That there is a disengagement that takes place. But there is an idea that the body is also part, you know, that we should not deny our bodies. In fact, the body is part of our being and does represent a very important aspect of our nature. And so the prayer is a physical prayer as well as being a spiritual prayer. That the body itself is being used as an act of worship. And so there is a standing. And then there's a bowing. And then a return. And then a prostration. And each of the limbs is participating in that. In fact, the seven limbs. Hakim talked about that. The seven limbs. And then there's an idea of putting the forehead right and the nose onto the ground literally onto the ground and the act of of, of this and uh, there's a symbolic act which is elevating the heart over the intellect that there is an idea that that in the act of worship that we are we are submitting the intellect and we are elevating the heart because the heart, according to the Muslims, is the organ of cognition. And what it, is, what, what, what it was created to do was to come to know God. It was to come to know God. So that, this is just, I mean, this is something some of the scholars have mentioned. It's not really, uh, it's just a symbolic type of... And then, the, uh, the prayer that I didn't mention here was the afternoon prayer. At the point that the sun reaches a point where the shadow will cast the like of a thing plus whatever the shadow at the meridian point was. So most people, if you measure your, your height to your feet, the vast majority of people, what they call the you know, two standard deviations, 
right, 95% of people are going to come between six and a half to seven feet of their height if you have normal foot size to your height. So if you, if you literally uh, lie down and put a quarter at the tip of your head and something at your feet and then you go, you see and measure it and you go one, two, three, you'll find that your height will generally be about seven feet. And so for the Muslim, the cl traditional Muslims measured the sun with their body, which is again using the body as an act of worship because measuring the sun's shadow is considered an act of worship. It's part of remembrance of God. And so you would go out, if you knew, for instance, like right now, for, for me, the, the meridian, the Dhuhr prayer is my, f my shadow is about two feet. So I would add to that seven. So when my shadow reaches nine feet, Asr time has come in, this prayer. So I go out at about five o'clock and I measure it and I'll find it's nine feet. That means I can pray Asr. All right, so that's the, that, that is uh, the afternoon prayer. So those are the five prayers. The sunset, the evening prayer, which is called Isha. The dawn prayer, which is called Fajr, which literally means dawn. And then the uh, post-meridian prayer, which is called Dhuhr. So those are the prayers. That's the first pillar. What you will do, or the second pillar, not including the Shahada. What you will do is you will, five times a day, stop everything. In Muslim countries, traditionally, people left their shops. I mean, this is less so now because Muslims are being secularized uh, like everybody else. Um, but traditionally, and you can still find this in some countries, Muslims will leave their shops. Oftentimes, they didn't lock them. They would literally put drapes because for somebody to steal while somebody was praying, even a thief had a sense of honor there, <laughs> right? That that was not a good thing to do. And it's interesting that traditionally, many, many court cases were decided based on what's called a oath, where the judge would say, do you swear by God that you're telling the truth or lying? Many, many, historically, many court cases were solved because people were quite literally afraid of uh, bearing false witness or, or lying. In that, and they would say, I can't say that. And, and, and that would literally end the trial. Many, many cases like that historically. So traditionally, people did have a sense, you know, that there were certain things. Even the thief had honor. Um, there's a famous story of Imam al-Ghazali, great theologian and, and scholar, uh, who studied in, uh, he's from Tus in Persia, and he'd studied uh, in uh, one of the great Persian cities, and he had spent two years transcribing all these books by hand, because these people, you know, there weren't printing presses, you wanted books, you had to write them out. He went to the library, spent two years doing that, and on the way back, a, they were, their, their caravan was attacked by brigands, and they were taking his books, and Al-Ghazari begged this chief of the thieves, don't, you can't take all my knowledge. And, he, and the thief laughed and he said, what kind of knowledge do you have when somebody like me can steal it? Mm -hmm. And Al-Ghazali said that he realized that God had made him say that, to, tell, to let him know and to remind him that true knowledge was not in books. Right. What's that? <laughs> yeah, that's it. What's that? Uh, the fifth prayer Let's see, you would have Maghrib, Isha, Fajr, Dhuhr, and Asr is the last prayer, Asr. And that means the afternoon prayer. Now, Just to let you know what the Muslims are encouraged to congregate for the prayer, but they don't have to. It's very highly encouraged to congregate. Women can, can go to the mosque and congregate if they like or if they don't. It's, it's not uh, encouraged for them. Uh, the house is actually uh, where the women generally pray in most Muslim cultures. And I will just make mention of certain phenomena that you relate. Traditionally, there was no barrier between the men and the women praying. That is a later uh, innovation. It was not the tradition of the Prophet. The Prophet did not have a barrier between the men and the women. 
That came later. In many Muslim countries, you still do not have that barrier. For instance, African countries, North Africa, you do not have that barrier. In the Middle East, uh, in the Indo-Pak cultures, you will tend to find barriers. So that is more of a cultural phenomenon. It is not a religious, it's not part of the religious tradition. Even this, what they call the Masharabiyya in the mosque here, which is this uh, a latticed woodwork between the men and the women, that is not uh, traditional. That is, well, it's traditional in terms of Muslim culture, but it is not from the religion. The religion does not say that. That is something that people introduced as a cultural uh, phenomenon. So, and that's important to remember. And there are some countries uh, that, you know, I think a few where, where there, there, there's an extreme patriarchy there, and, you know, women, it's really hard for them to pray in the mosque. And that, again, is a cultural phenomenon because the Prophet prohibited that. He said, do not prohibit women from going to the mosques. And, and it's a sound hadith. Where? Um, I think probably on, on the Arabian Peninsula, you, you will find in some of the mosques in the villages. In Mecca and Medina, definitely not. There are women praying there. Mecca, uh, you'll look here, the black uh, are def generally the women in the pictures. If you see of Mecca, the Kaaba, when you see big black groupings, those are generally the women and the white are, are the men, right? Because in that country, they, they tend to wear black and white. Uh, the men wear white, the women wear black. In Algeria, the women wear white. Uh, so that, again, is a cultural thing of color. In West Africa, where Dr. Nyang is from, women very, they're like cockatoos, you know, they're very, very colorful. Um, lot of color in, in their, uh, their hijab. And um, uh, Morocco, the, it's pretty much almost like a basic kind of unisex type. Uh, they, they wear a jalaba. And the differences would be in the colors, but the actual uh, jalaba is very similar. The women wear the same dress as the men do, um, except the colors uh, distinguish. So, uh -huh. The communities that do this gender separation, do they think of it and explain it as being Islam? I Despite think, they, the I think mostly they do. The, I think most of them do. You know, and you get, you know, I mean, patriarchy is a phenomenon worldwide and and we're as uh, we are as susceptible to it as any other culture I think there's been a lot of artificial mechanisms at trying to break it down but nonetheless the, you know there's still a lot of remnants I'll give you some examples in in Muslim law and Rukai is going to talk about this but in Muslim law a, a, a woman uh, does not have to uh, serve her husband in her house and she cannot be forced to if she refuses to cook, the man has to provide somebody who will cook or he has to cook himself. She is highly encouraged to do that, but it is literally within the Islamic law that she has a right to say, I don't want to cook. Right? It's, in, it's based on the hadith and based on uh, uh, the scholar's interpretation, but this is literally 1400 years ago when this was, these judgments were being pronounced. Um, you know, that women, the money is theirs. If a woman earns money, she can actually go to a qadi. If the husband takes the money from her, she has a right to go to a qadi because uh, it's, it's a crime. It's not his money. Any money that comes into hers is hers, whereas the money that the, the man earns, a portion of it has to go to the woman by, by, by law. So there, it's very interesting. You know, I think that, uh, you know, the phenomenon of... of uh, the abuse of, of certain characteristics that the man, certainly physical, which is changing in this country, but generally in most societies, men tend to be physically stronger and have been able to coerce uh, women physically to do things. And there's a very interesting verse in the Quran, uh, which is about Asya, the wife of Pharaoh, Pharaoh, when she says, Oh God, save me from my husband, the tyrant. And I just find that's really fascinating that that's a dua, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a prayer in the Quran from a woman about her husband who's a tyrant being asked to be saved from him. And I just wonder historically, you know, how many women that that has been a type of, you know, sustenance for that type, you know, in this culture as well. I mean, we have, we still have very serious problems with domestic violence We've, and we tend to really look at the, the public space and not so much, we forget about the private space, about uh, you know, a lot of mental cruelty, a lot, it's all still going on 
Um, but there's a type of openness that has emerged in the culture where these things, you know, people can talk about them. Mauritania, where uh, Sheikh Abdullah's from, uh, you know, we were talking about this, about uh, domestic violence and things like that. And it's interesting that in Mauritania, it's impossible for a man to hit a woman. It's literally impossible. One, because of tribe. In other words, marital relationships are very, you know, they're very related to the family. And so for, for there to be any injustices towards the woman, it's going to affect very uh, heavily on relationships, inter-family relationships and things like that. And the women generally tend to be very educated from his uh, group particularly and know their rights and, and they're, they're quite, they're, they're strong women. There's no, also no polygamy in that culture at all because the women put a condition in their marriage contracts, I don't want a second wife. And they know that's a right that they have. Right? They can stipulate that in a contract and they do that. That's that the, absolutely. From it's from, again, it's, it's from the scholars' understanding and interpretation. That, and the, that there are early community instances where that was from the companions, where that was established. Did somebody ask a question? Yes, did mm -hmm. you say more about the evolution? Ablution? The cleansing, I guess. Okay, good point about the prayer. There is a water cleansing, ablution. I hate that word. I, know, I, think, well, I don't know where that comes from, ablution, ritual ablutions. It's a, it's a Latin word, but I just don't, don't like it. Is it. It's Catholic, do you think? Is it? It's used in the Catholic Church. It is, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's where they got it. It's always bothered me, that word. I just don't like the way it sounds. It sounds like something bad, ablution. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, do your ablutions, right? Um, the, 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 there is a water purification, a ritual purification with water before you pray. You should use a small amount of water. It's not meant to waste water. It's actually encouraged to use a small amount. And it's, a, it's basically a washing of the face, the arms up to the elbows, a wiping of the head, not a washing, just a light wiping, and then a cleansing of the feet. And the idea is to enter into a ritual state, you know, I mean, all religious traditions have this idea of ent entering into a ritual state of purity before you go into the divine space. And that, that, that's the idea there. And, if there's, and the proof that it is ritual and not related to actual physical type, although it does have physical uh, qualities, is that, that you can use earth to do it in the absence of water. So you use the earth. The Prophet Muhammad said that the earth was, the earth was, given to my community as a place of worship, the entire earth, that we can worship anywhere on the earth, and as a purification, that the earth is seen as a source of purification. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said in a, in a, a tradition related by uh, Tabarani, he said, um, beware of your mother, the earth, that you should transgress or oppress her, because she will bear witness against all of those who, who have uh, transgressed against her. And there is an idea in the Islamic tradition, literally the Prophet Muhammad said that the entire earth is raised up on the Yom Qiyamah, on the Day of Judgment, and will bear witness. And the Prophet Muhammad said that rocks will bear witness, that trees will bear witness, that rivers will bear witness against those who did harm to them without uh, just cause. Right? Uh-huh? Is there a ritual cleansing for women after their There is. Like in the Jewish tradition, yeah. The, a woman is considered ritually impure during the menstrual cycle and she does not pray during that period, right? Because that, that is a, a cleansing time. She does not pray during that period. She's absolved from the prayer. And there's nothing, there's no stigma related to, in fact, the Prophet Muhammad, because in, like in the, some of the Orthodox Jewish tradition, the woman is, you know, the, the man stays away. Yeah, she's separate. The Prophet knew because there were Jews living in Medina and he wanted to break that tradition and it's recorded that he recited the Quran while on the lap of his wife Aisha while she was menstruating. And he was letting people know that there's nothing wrong with the woman during that time. It's, it's just a period of a personal purification and it does not extend beyond her. She can cook. Like, she, she's allowed to cook during that time. She's allowed to, in fact, even uh, uh, foreplay is allowed during that time between a male and a female. But the Prophet said, avoid what is between the belly button and the knee. In other words, don't, because that's a time that's prohibited for actual sexual intercourse. But the Prophet said that is a time when male and female could have, um, uh, like, foreplay, sexual foreplay 
with the exclusion of intercourse only. So, any questions now, just about all that's transpired? Was there a number of uh, times, the repetitions for the ablutions? Uh, good, yeah. Three is, is encouraged. One is what's ob ob obligatory, and three is encouraged. No more than three. It would be discouraged after, uh-huh. Is there anything to the notion that certain sects wash their hands from the hands to the elbow and others from the elbow? No. One way, there's one way to do it, which is down like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, pretty much all the schools are, are the same on the, the, the wudu and the prayer. The prayer, there's some difference like Maliki, a school prays with hands at the side, and also the Shia uh, pray with their hands at the side. The other schools uh, pray with the hands here or here, some up here. So you're going to get slight variations, but the basic movements are the same. And some will move their finger to concentrate in the last part of the prayer, and some won't. Mm -hmm. Do they do the left hand first and then the right hand? Second? Right hand, always right to left. In, in the Muslim tradition, left, you know, it's cosmological. Left, I mean, in Latin, sinistra is, is left, right? There's always this idea that left is kind of sinister, it's the bad side. Uh, in the Muslim tradition, it's not, it's not like that. There's not a stigma like that about left hand. Like in, in Europe, there was a stigma related to being left handed. And uh, people, I mean, my mother was, she went to Catholic schools. She was left handed. She got the ruler uh, until she learned to write with her right hand, which now we know is actually uh, damages. Um, that, that's, you know, one of the things that pe some people think are, are result in, in learning disabilities and things like that because there's a, there's a confusion that takes place in the, in the body as a result of that. But in the Muslim tradition, there's nothing, there's no stigmatism related. Like I'm left-handed, Omar ibn al-Khattab, he wrote with his left hand, there's no stigmatism attached to that. Um, but people are, are supposed to eat with their right hand. The left hand is used for cleaning, um, like the urine and cleaning the feces. Right? So the right hand is, you, that's why you would never shake with your left hand. You would always shake with your right hand. So in Muslim cultures, the right hand is very important. And one of the reasons that the thief loses the right hand is it's when they break the, you know, there's a deep breach of the social contract when a, a human being steals from another human being. And there is a, literally a severing from the, the, uh, the society that takes place. So to lose the right hand is a very traumatic uh, experience in the Muslim culture. Is there any linguistic parallel between the white and the word right and the word law as there is in the number of Absolutely, yeah. Right, yameen, means, you know, uh, it's like an oath is called swearing, a yameen, right. I swear that this is true. You're swearing with the right. Um, and also, yuman is a good omen. And Sha'am, which is related to the left, is a bad omen. So there is a cosmology involved in it. And also the idea um, in classical cosmology, which is Indo-European as well as Chinese. Uh, you know, the Chinese, in the Chinese cosmology, the south is yang, which is over. And the, the, the north is yin, which is under. The same in the Indic, uh, the Dravidian culture and the Indic cultures. That the, the word for south is in Sanskrit uh, relates to over or above, and the word for north is under. And classically, maps were generally put the south on the top. And you will notice out there that Aladrisi's map puts Africa on the top and Europe on the bottom. There was a switch with the European cartographers when they kind of realized that there's some philosophical implications here. Um, being under or inferior as opposed to being over and superior and they literally switched uh, the maps around but the, the the book that a lot of European cartography was based upon was the book of Roger which was done by Aladrisi for the Sicilian king um, of, uh, of Sicily Roger and he had his maps with the south on the top which is related to facing the east in the morning so the back is called Gharb, or the unknown, which is west. The east is called the Mashriq, or facing the radiance of the sun. The uh, south is th called the right, like Yemen means the right. It's also the southernmost place in the Arabian Peninsula. And sh Shamal is from north, which is from Shimal, which means left. So north is considered left to the, to the human body. In terms of this is cosmological, in terms of cosmology. So the, the north would be under the, the south. And the Muslims traditionally did their astrolabes with the south 
uh, as, as the, it was, the, the projection was from the south, looking up uh, to the sky. <coughs> Any other questions? Uh -huh. uh, you said earlier that uh, in some countries or cultures it's uh, difficult for the Muslims to be reflective about their religion. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could enumerate some of the reasons why it's difficult to do. Well, because I think people in the Muslim culture, it's just a given that you're right. You know, like it used to be that way in this culture. You know, it was just given. Christianity was true. Everything else is false. That, that's just a given of any culture that has a dominant religious teaching that still has power and influence. And certainly Islam is still in that position in the Muslim world where to question or to really think, why am I a Muslim? You know, other than the fact that I was born here, that most people won't come to that. Uh, there, would be, there, would be, there would be judgment. There would be social stigma, yeah. for one. But see, I don't even think that that should negate even if there was, it's still important to, to reflect and think. You know, I mean, you have always had uh, people within cultures that have, have questioned things. I mean, there were, there were always people in the Christian tradition that remained Christians, but they could still challenge the culture. Sometimes they were burnt at the stake, other times they weren't. But the point is that there were people that would say, you know, is this right? Or is what we're doing right? I mean, that's an important human question. And uh, this is just a lot of uh, non-reflective people. And then... I think there's a lot of encouragement uh, for, for the absence of reflection for social political reasons. You know, I mean, in this country, uh, you know, we're a country of entertainment. People know massive things about sports and basketball and baseball and football and adults that can give you brilliant analyses of, you know, uh, why this team's going to make it to the Super Bowl and have all their stats at hand. And they don't have a clue about the national debt or why we're paying over 50% of our tax dollar to interest on our national debt, or why our schools are, are literally crumbling before our eyes, why there's uh, children killing children. Why, you know, really, there, there's just not a lot of emphasis on analyzing, on thinking, on seeing. So, I, you know, we're as much, I think, you know, we, the Americans, we, you know, we tend to delude ourselves uh, often. I mean, you're all educated people, so, it's probably not the case, but there are certainly a lot of people out there that really haven't given a lot of thought. Um, that they're they're much more uh, obsessed with uh, you know the latest entertainment, their, uh, what the latest movie is out there. You know, the Romans controlled their societies with bread and circus, right? Bread, bread and circus. It's a very common political way of maintaining. A What's the specific rationale behind prohibition eating pork? A pork. Okay, uh, rationale, there are two things in the, in the Sharia uh, that are understood by the Muslims. One is that there are some things that, that we know why and there are other things that we don't. The things that we know why with absolute certainty are those things that we're told in the Quran or in the Hadith that that's why it was prohibited. For instance, in the Quran it says, do not go near sexual perversions because they are foulness and they lead down a terrible road. So illicit sexual relations. The idea is that they will lead down a terrible road. There's a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad that perversity will never manifest in a people except they're afflicted with diseases and illnesses that were unknown to previous generations. So the Muslims would see that, you know, that breaching sexual uh, laws that, that are given by God from the Muslim perspective result there are consequences. In other words, that the moral realm has laws that impact us at the biological, at the psychosocial level, just as there are physical laws of cause and effect and, and things like that. Right? So, so Muslims see that morality is not this arbitrary thing, that there is a reason. Right? And, and this is the way the Muslims view it. And I, I think a lot of Christians have that feeling too. I mean, a lot of Christians point out that if you are uh, monogamous, uh, you will not, you know, if, if two people who are, are both virgins enter into a marital situation and do not uh, breach those boundaries, they do not, they're not susceptible to venereal diseases. It is a simple fact of uh, biology, right? So uh, that, that's at one level. Now the other level is that there are things that we don't know why God has said don't do this. And the reason that the scholars say is that there are some things that he has not told us is because it's, one, a test. 
that will you do it even though your intellect is not fully capable of comprehending the wisdom behind it a and two um, that uh, it's, it's an as aspect of submission again now the scholars have always encouraged seeking reasons wisdoms to increase people's faith but never to say as an absolute this is why concerning pig generally pig uh, has been considered an unclean animal um, it eats uh, unclean things um, its form is, is uh, it's an unclean uh, form. And, you know, I, uh, some modern Jews, like Reformed Jewish tradition, so, some of them who've gone to very liberal positions have pointed out, you know, this was really for trichinosis and diseases that related, to, but now that we know scientifically, and they would actually consider it acceptable to eat pig, the Muslims would never go to that. Uh, uh huh. Shellfish, shellfish is discouraged according to Imam Abu Hanifa. But it, the reason that it is not prohibited is because uh, there is a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad um, that what comes out of the sea is pure and halal for you. And, and that's where it comes from. But, but Abu Hanifa did consider it uh, makru to eat shellfish that it, because it ate unclean things. And that was the reason that, that he gave. So that is a position, but it's not a dominant position. And again, one of the things that the Quran mentions is part of the Prophet's message was to lighten the load of the previous dispensations. So the, it, there are actually some lightening of loads concerning what was binding on the, on the Jewish tradition because they, uh, the, from the point that it, it, people were getting weaker at maintaining uh, the guidelines of God. And so there was kind of making it easier for people for this last stage of, of human existence because people do not have the same spiritual capacities as the ancients did. Uh, so there's that idea as well. Any other questions about this? So we'll go on to the next, um, the next pillar, which is zakat. The word zakat means, it comes from a root word which means to purify. And the idea is that it is a purification of your wealth. Everybody in accruing wealth will have some either clearly doubtful or even really doubtful uh, you know, uh, aspects to the accruement of wealth. So the idea is that zakat is a way of purifying your wealth. And the Prophet Muhammad was prohibited the taking of zakat for his own family. They cannot be recipients of zakat, Bani Hashim. The reason is, is that he said that zakat is like the, the feces of wealth. In other words, the body needs to let go of its impurities in, in order to maintain its purity. And zakat is seen as a letting go of one's wealth in order to purify and make the, 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 the wealth that it has grow, literally. Yeah, but it, it, how do they then turn that around um, to the recipient who receives The recipient who receives the wealth, for, for the person it is a purification. Yes. For the one receiving the wealth, it is a right. It's seen as a right, and so it changes perspective. There's a shift in perspective. In other words, the one receiving it is not receiving anything filthy, right? It's a right, and it's encouraged when you give zakat to somebody to not tell them it's zakat, so that they don't feel, to give it as a gift, so that they don't feel, because some people have a pride, they don't want to feel like, they're, like a welfare type state that I'm, I need, that it's encouraged. You don't have to tell them it's zakat. You, uh, it's also encouraged to give it smiling with a, you know, as seeing that it's an honor. So the person giving it, these are in the books of fiqh related to giving zakat, that you're supposed to give it in humility, not in arrogance. That you give it to the person literally feeling like you're honored to do that thing. And the Prophet said one of the signs of the end of time is people will consider zakat like a fine. You know, in other words, they wouldn't see it as an honor, but rather as like taxes nowadays, right? Have to pay it. Clearly both parties involved, both sides know kind of what's going on. I mean, don't they have an understanding of 
I mean, like you say, it's I've given zakat many times in which the people had no idea that it was zakat. Oh, really? Absolutely, many times. Can, how would like? Is there any example that you can give of like how? Would that well, Muslims, Muslims. I think you'd be really surprised at, at you know the generosity of Muslims that are practicing to other Muslims. They're they're very generous. If, if within a community, like in my community, for instance, we had a man who recently lost his job, and, uh, and I found out about it, and I knew that he was in a hard condition. I contacted a few people, and in one day we raised $4,000, uh, and, and I gave that to that person, right, just to help him for the next couple months until he could uh, get a job again. And I didn't tell him, I said, this, this is a gift, you know. Now there were people that gave it as zakat, but I didn't. You know, I don't have to tell them it's zakat. Mm -hmm. There are times when you will find things on your doorstep. That's true. You may find a, a rack of lamb. You may find an envelope with money, and you don't know who. Very there. common in the Muslim community. There's definitely. Uh, I think Muslims do still have a, a sense of taking care, like things like homelessness in the Muslim world. Those are still real shocking. Like the other day we saw a man, in, and I was with Sheikh Abdullah, and he didn't have a shirt on. And he asked me first if he was crazy. Because in their country, you would never not wear a shirt in public. It would literally be, for them, it's a sign somebody was mad. And, uh, and the same with shorts. That's, like, that's something he hasn't, I don't think he's quite grasped it yet. Just because their culture is still very, very modest. Um, but we told him that he's probably homeless. And he said, what does that mean? And, and you know, he did, literally didn't know what it meant. Because <laughs> in that country, you could build a, they just build like a, uh, uh, they take uh, tree limbs and, and the women will sew like uh, burlap saps together and make a little house. And you don't have to pay property tax and you don't have to, you know, you just set up shop. And he didn't have a concept of like being homeless. And, uh, and then he just said to me, with all of this, like, there's so much here. You know, because he's coming from a place where there's nothing. And he said, how is it that, like, somebody could be without a place to, to sleep? With all, like, he just, it was something that I don't think his intellect really could quite uh, grasp, right? Very kind of interesting. Really interesting book to read about this is Winners and Losers in the New World Order by Jacques Attali, right? He talks about this phenomenon of, of increasingly, uh, you know, people becoming accustomed to planetary boat people. That's what he calls them. Planetary boat people. Where you'll go to the ATM and, and the bums there and we just become inured to it because uh, it just becomes more and more difficult for people to deal with. Them. Um, how is the giving of the cup in relationship to whether the receiver is Muslim or not? The receiver, that's a good question. Let me tell you just, and I'm going to get to that. Let me tell you basically, zakat is a local tax. It is not meant to go outside of the community. The Prophet said, those closest to you are most worthy of your help. So the idea of acting locally is really important. That, you know, if, if, you're, if you're fighting for the rights of the Tibetans, you know, and your own community, there's people oppressed, the Muslims would see that as a kind of disconnection. Doesn't mean that you're not sympathetic with something happening over there, but the thing is you begin at home. You begin cleaning up your own home. So zakat goes back to the wealth of the local community. If there was no one in that community that is impoverished or needs zakat, then it will go outside of the community. And you first give to your relatives who are in need before you would give to strangers. Now, the recipients of zakat, there are eight categories mentioned in the Quran itself, and those are considered the only recipients of zakat. One of the only non-Muslim group are, are what are called mu'allafat qulubuhum, which are people who are very close to Islam. They're, they're very interested in Islam, they're close to Islam, those people, uh, it's permissible to give them zakat money. If they're not Muslim, then you can, you can donate money to them, but you cannot give zakat. Zakat is the right of poor Muslims. In other words, the idea that you take care of your own before you go outside. But traditionally, the Muslims in, uh, in the early 19th century, when, during a famine in, in France, 
the Bay of, uh, of Tunis and Algeria sent um, wheat to, uh, to Europe to help uh, relieve the famine. So traditionally the Muslims did have a concept of helping uh, other peoples if they had a surplus. But first you help uh, the people within your community. And then also Jewish, there's a, a beautiful story of Sayyidina Omar because Jewish and Christian and non-Muslim peoples like Buddhists and others pay a tax to live under the Muslims. And um, Omar saw a, a Jewish man begging, an old man, and he said, why is this man begging? And they said, he doesn't have any money. And he said, uh, we took money from him when he was young, so we should take care of him in his old age. And so he demanded that oh, Christian and Jews and other people, if they had no one within their community to take care of them, then there should be money taken out of the, what's called the Bayt al-Mal, or the collective bank of the Muslim government to help those people. And it's interesting that during the time of Omar ibn Abd al-Aziz in Damascus, the government actually paid for and supplied um, people, not dogs, but people to take care of blind people as an employment, right, which is mentioned in the books. Uh, is there a certain percentage then that they make Good question. The, the, the percentage is there are, two, there are three types of zakat. Income tax is prohibited in Islam. You cannot tax people for income that they're using to live by. You can only tax them according to standing wealth that one year has accumulated. So if a year has passed and you still have the wealth, that's what you pay zakat on. You don't pay zakat based on what you made that year. So if I made $50,000 but at the end of the year I have zero, which is the case of a lot of people in this country, right, and they actually have to borrow to pay the IRS, that that you do not uh, pay any zakat. You pay zakat at the end of a lunar year you pay zakat on what you have that a year has transpired with. And, that, and you pay 140th. 2.5%. On the leftover? No, of the entire thing. So if I had $40, I would pay $1. Oh, yes, so you pay 140th of what remains after, after the whole year. Yes. Yeah, it's not a big, big amount. But if. Uh huh, go ahead. You may, you may only need, let's say, uh, you know, a six thousand dollar car to get around. Right. I mean, you you may you may only need, let's say, uh, you know, a six thousand dollar car to get around. But, but you buy a hundred thousand dollar one. Exactly. Okay. Um, Herb asked, a, I think, a good question. Where, where does want and need come into this? In other words, if I'm a wealthy person, I buy a car for $100,000. And, and I'm a poor person, I buy one for $500. Do, is there, can I just spend my money on that? Yes. Wealthy people, their money is discretionary. It is highly discouraged to waste, and it is actually prohibited to be uh, grossly extravagant. But the Prophet Muhammad said, Allah loves to see the traces of his blessings on his creatures. And so it's encouraged for a wealthy person to dress, not extravagantly. He should wear things in order to show the blessing on him. And it's, you know, it's, there's a beautiful book about, called Envy Towards a Social Theory. Fascinating book about the, the, the uh, disruptive aspects of envy in a culture. And uh, the, one of the worst things in Islam is envy. It's literally considered one of the worst things. It's one of the sedly, seven deadly sins in the, uh, in the Christian Catholic truths. And my father was Catholic and he said that he's, um, he's unfortunately familiar with about four of them. And uh, his friend told him, one's enough to kill you. <laughs> but envy is one of the seven deadly sins, right, in, in, our, in, in our Western tradition. In, in the Islamic tradition, it's also one of the real bad uh, thing. And, and so the idea is that poor people should not envy rich people. It's, it's really considered a bad thing to envy rich people. Poor people should thank God. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad said, in terms of your worldly condition, always look to people below you. And in terms of your other worldly condition, always look at people better than you. So in terms of righteousness, piety, look at people that are superior to you that you might never become deluded about yourself and you always want to improve. But in terms of the material world, look at people 
worse off than you so that you feel grateful for what you have. Mm -hmm. What was the book that you said was, uh, you mentioned the infinitely effective? Yeah, it's called Envy Towards a Social Theory, and it's, it's a German author, and I can't remember his name right now. I actually just got the book a couple months ago, and so I don't have the author's name. Mm -hmm. If um, there's no income tax, and zakat is determined on somebody's net, um, yeah. It's like a capital gains tax, more. You know, it's like capital at the end of the year. Okay. Does does the zakat satisfy and fulfill the needs of the poor? Is it their poor do? Is it? There is a scholar in Qatar who has proven that if zakat was paid in the Muslim world, there would be a gross surplus of wealth today. It's very interesting because there's also zakat of agriculture and livestock. So uh, agriculture has one-fifth. Now the World Bank estimated that if 2% of, uh, uh, of the world's agricultural crops were, were taxed, 2%, that there would be no hunger anywhere. Now Islam says 5% for irrigation that you did yourself, 10% for agriculture based on natural irrigation, like rain and things like that. So if you didn't work, you pay more. If you did irrigation, you pay less. So 10% of wheat, corn, um, barley, all of these grains is taxed and, and it's supposed to be given and distributed to the poor. Also livestock. So uh, for every uh, five camels, one sheep is given, like that. Right, 30, 30 cows, a calf, Th 40, uh-huh. Question, um, you were talking about the uh, livestock, and I was just thinking about, uh, uh, <coughs> about Saudi Arabia, you know, and all the, all the pilgrims, when, they, when they, all these people come and they wish to make sacrifices. Right. How do they deal with them? They, they can them and they send them around to poor people around the world. That's what they do now. The, the meat that's sacrificed during the Hajj, and no, I, like I didn't sacrifice. You don't have to sacrifice if you made a, uh, a, there's three ways of making hajj. And I made it the way that the Prophet ﷺ made it, where you, it's not obligatory to sacrifice. You can if you want to. I did not sacrifice. Um, but if you do sacrifice, the meat can either be eaten there, it's, it's encouraged to distribute it amongst the poor. And the Eid, the reason that it's encouraged to sacrifice during the Eid, traditionally, was that poor people generally did not eat meat very often. <laughs> And so the idea was on the Eid, it was a time when you brought meat to the poor people to give them meat. Um, now meat is becoming more increasingly uh, cheaper, and so you're finding people are, are meat eaters all over. Um, Sayyidina Omar said, beware of meat, because it has the addiction of wine. And he also said to one man who used to eat meat every day, every time you desire meat, you buy it? And he said, yes. And he said, I'm afraid you're going to be from the people who lose all their good deeds in this world. Uh, in other words, that you enjoy the world so much that you can't show the right, right gratitude. So it was not encouraged to eat meat all the time. And now Muslims have become heavy meat eaters. But traditionally, most Muslim cultures were really more semi-vegetarian uh, cultures. It's kind of more of a recent phenomenon, the heavy meat. And beef is very new in the Muslim world. Traditionally, Muslims were not beef eaters. They were goat and sheep. Uh -huh. In Muslim culture, where, particularly in the 20th century, where there's been, you say, oil is going well, how is that effective as a kind? Is it causing problems? That's a really good point. Yeah, there is a lot of problems. There's a lot of resentment, there's a lot of envy, things like that. But technically, um, buried wealth, there's different opinions about it. Most of the scholars say that it goes to the Muslim. Uh, collective bank, what's called the Bayt al-Mal, and it should be used to develop uh, the Muslim communities, to help the poor, to build schools, to do these things. It should not be personal wealth. Some say that no, 20 percent, uh, it should be taxed 20 percent, and then the land of the people that it was found on, they're the ones that uh, benefit from it. So there are some differences of opinion, um, but there's definitely, in many of the countries where there's been natural resources uh, discovered, and the Muslims do have a lot of natural resources in the Muslim communities. Um, there's just been a gross um, expropriation of the wealth and exploitation of it, which is very unfortunate. And there's also been a lot of outside 
uh, influences. I mean, we know when Mossadegh, who was the prime minister of Iran, uh, wanted to nationalize the oil, um, you know, there was a CIA coup that, that, that ousted him. So there's hands outside that are also impacting very seriously how the wealth is being used. Um, people, if you know about petrodollars, then you know the fact that the vast majority of petro wealth is literally being supplanted uh, and, and invested in Western banks, and the Western banks, in turn, are using that to finance a lot of the projects in the, in the quote-unquote third world, which end up causing major problems because of interest payment and things like that. So, very complicated uh, world conditions. But, but I think they're really worthwhile bringing up to your students, you know, because we have to, as communities, we just have to start thinking about this stuff. You know, we're just, we're so marginalized from, uh, from these uh, dialogues. And I think just normal people should, should be participating in, in trying to understand what's going on. Why, you know, why, why are uh, countries like Mexico, you know, paying these massive interests to, you know, there's more interest now coming out of the third world than there is aid going into it. So there's a lot of very serious contradictions going on. And then a lot of the massive projects that are being developed, the World Bank and the IMF, encouraging these gross uh, projects, the, the dam now in China and, and uh, Brazil and these type of things that really, uh, if you read somebody like Suzanne George, uh, really worth reading, Fate Worse Than Debt, Ill Fares the Land, How the Other uh, Side Dies. Um, she worked for the World Bank and, and then kind of reneged and realized that she felt that they were doing a lot more harm than, than good. And she's written some really, really worthwhile critiques. Uh, and not from a kind of conspiratorial type, uh, just really kind of analyzing the thing. I think in, in very, Suzanne George, she, she, she's, she works now, that I think she's supported by the Catholic uh, Church, actually, one of their organizations. Uh -huh. You said there are eight types of cup. I mean, there are eight recipients. Recipients. There are three types of cup. Can you run through them? Poor people. By definition, there are two types of poor people. One is called miskeen, and the other is called faqir in the Quran. The miskeen is the one who doesn't even have a day's worth of, uh, of their livelihood. The poor one is who, of somebody who does not have a year's s supply. They do not have enough money to get through a year and they are accepted as a recipient uh, for... for yeah, that's a good point. Um, if the person is known to use things, like if they're alcoholic or known to do things, then yeah, you should not support people that you know the money is going to go uh, and there are more worthy people for it. That, that is encouraged to look for the, the more worthy um, people. And then you have the people who collect it. So there is a portion of it taken out to employ the zakat collectors. And then you have indebted people, people who are in debt. And that is a type of debt as long as it was not accrued through wrong actions like gambling. And it is a debt in which they're in serious trouble. The debt has reached a level where the socially they're, they're really being jeopardized. Um, and then you have the, and also uh, indentured servants, people who bonds people. Because in Islam, traditionally, although this doesn't exist anymore in the Muslim world, traditionally there were people who were bonds people that were under the yoke of somebody. And those people in Sharia, if they desire to be freed from that uh, yoke, then they have a right to zakat, to pay off uh, their, uh, whatever their worth is, right? And, and so that's a group. And then also the, um, so that's five. And then you have um, the, what do you mean? And then you have people, the Ibn Sabil, who is somebody who's traveling and this is also pre-ATM um, because it, he can be a wealthy person as well. So it's somebody who's traveling and they were robbed and they're w far away from their home and they don't have access. And it still happens because ATM isn't, right? 80% of the world still doesn't have um, telephones, <laughs> by the way, right? So um, here we forget about that, right? But uh, it's, it's for somebody who was traveling and they lost their wealth. Those people are asked, 
uh, the, you know, it's, they're permitted to get the, uh, to receive the zakat. And then for people who are called mu'allafat qulubuhum, which are either near Islam or they have just come into Islam and you can give them zakat as a way of binding their hearts to the community. And then the last group is fi sabilillah, which are people who are defending uh, the homelands. So anybody who is, uh, is defending like jihad, like the Bosnians, when they were fighting, many people sent their zakat to Bosnia uh, or Afghanistan, for instance, right? And there are many people, I think, that's, that support the Palestinians, uh, you know, viewing that as a valid, uh, you know, struggle, things like that. So that, that's basically the, uh, those are the recipients, according to the Quran. Um, I would think that the answer to this would be no, but here in America, the Muslim, and you're paying 35% income tax. Uh, you also pay 2.5% wealth tax? Absolutely. In fact, more so. Some of the scholars have said, if you're giving 35% to you know, the American uh, government, which is using a lot of it for things that... You've got to that you should yeah. probably give 35 per, another 35 percent just to just to counterbalance and then pay zakat on top of that. <laughs> a lot of Muslims have a lot of cognitive dissonance about taxes in this country, a lot, particularly immigrants who, you know, their their countries are, you know, there's just a lot of problems going on and and they feel just there's a lot of cognitive dissonance there, you know, because of such a huge portion of our taxes go to military, you know, I think what, 54% is still allotted to uh, defense and military budgets and things like that. I mean, what are we, what's education? 17%, is it even, no, I think it's what? 17%? It's about 17%, right? So, but again, it's, if you're in a country, you have to follow the laws of the land. So it's actually prohibited to, if you come into a country by Sharia, even though the laws are against Islam, you either have to make hijra or you have to follow those laws. It is prohibited, like it would be prohibited for a Muslim to uh, cheat on the income tax, given that that is a law in this country. They would either have to leave or they would have to pay it because the conditions of coming into the country, one of the conditions is that you'll obey the laws of the land. And the Prophet said, uh, the Quran says that fulfill the trust that you have given to its people. So when a person comes into this country with a, you know, a, a visa or a green card or, and it says you're expected to obey the laws of the land, then you are expected to. So it's actually a breach of, of Islam not to. And, and that is something, unfortunately, some Muslims aren't aware of, you know. Uh -huh. I just want to clarify one point. I heard two different things. One, that it cannot be for your own family, and the other, that it's first to be for your own family. No, it can't be for your own family if it's like a trick. In other words, I give my wife my zakat, she gives me her zakat. <laughs> no, it's to your family if they're poor and worthy, then they should be the first recipients. Now the government does have the right, if there was a valid Islamic government, they do have the right to collect zakat. That is a right of the government, and the government would distribute it. In the absence of government uh, gathering of zakat, then it is an individual responsibility on the Muslims. How do you determine what is a valid um, government? It, well, any government that has, uh, that, that has the authority is, is considered you know, valid. If there's like, it's prohibited to, uh, to go out against the government. Like revolution is actually prohibited in Islam in the Sunni tradition, not in the Shia tradition. They do have a difference. I mean, that is an important distinction. The Sunni tradition believes that they have a right to fight and oppose an unjust government. Whereas the, Sun the Shia, the Sunni tradition says that the people should be patient and ask God to change the conditions and rectify themselves, but they should not actually physically bear arms because that would lead to a greater uh, tribulation than the actual injustice which is bloodshed amongst uh, people. So in the Sunni tradition it's actually uh, like what's happening in Algeria for instance that is that's prohibited uh, by Islamic law to do that and that is the classical Islamic view and the group that goes out are called Khawarij which are the seceders and you can find them historically there's always been 
uh, groups that have said that. But tr the traditional Sunni position is that you cannot go against the, uh, the ruler. Any other questions? When you mention a legitimate uh, Islamic government, would this be a government that has as its ultimate law? The Absolutely. I mean, that's the ideal. But even if they're not implementing the Quran and they don't openly say that they don't believe in it, they're still considered uh, the legitimate government. So they would then have the right to collect them. Sometimes. Yes. <coughs> and, and this could be in lieu of uh, a welfare department or something like this. Zakat, that's the whole point of zakat. Yeah, it's to, in, it's to help the poor people. It's a right of the poor people. And it's interesting because the Prophet said, take the, your, from your wealthy the zakat and return it to the poor people. So it's almost like, you know, people get rich off poor people because the vast majority of the world's population is poor. And we forget that. You know, we really do have a very high living standard. But the vast majority of the world's population are poor people. And the wealth, even America's wealth, is largely dependent on a lot of, uh, you know, of wealth from other countries. You know, we have very cheap oil in this country. I mean, for example, for a liter of Coke is about how much? I don't buy Coke, but what are you paying there? A dollar. A dollar? You know, you're paying more for sugar and water than you are for a liter of oil. Right? And sugar and water are pretty much inexhaustible uh, resources relatively. I know there's some problems now with water and things like that. Whereas oil, you know, you're dealing with an exhaustible resource. It's grossly underpriced. Oil is grossly underpriced. I mean, we, you know, we're paying $1.40 for a gallon of gas. It'll take you 30 miles, 40 miles, and you pay you know, relatively the same amount for a bottle of sugar water that's going to rot your teeth and give you diabetes, you know. So it's really interesting that, that oil is so cheap. And uh, I mean, oil should probably be around, what's that? I was saying four or five. At least. I mean, my father now, that's what he's in. You know, he left teaching and got in because my grandfather was in the oil business and he got in it through, when he married my mother, he, uh, he started working in that and uh, he's always going on about it. it drives him crazy because, uh, you know, he said it should be around at least 50 a barrel or something like that. It's just grossly underpriced. So, but we have the luxury of having very cheap oil and the majors, they, it's hard to believe, but they actually maintain those, those low prices, you know, so. And the, the, the explore, exploration in this country is, it's unbelievable how difficult it is to explore oil in this country. There are still lots of, you know, oil reserves in this country, and most of the old uh, oil fields of the 1930s and 40s uh, were very shallow. You know, they didn't have the technology to go down, you know, several miles. They just would go down very short amounts. But uh, oil is it's really discouraged to explore oil in this country, and, and most of the majors are just not interested anymore. You know, because the, there's the, you know they're making so much money off. Uh, it's yeah, it's more expensive. It's much cheaper to uh, to buy underpriced oil from the Arabian <coughs> Peninsula than it is to uh, you know to uh, explore and, and exploit the resources here. Mm -hmm. I know you want to cover the last couple of points here, but. Um, let me just clarify one thing. Is it so Muslims in the United States would pay obviously the federal and state and city income property taxes yeah. that they owe? In addition to that, they pay two they would, percent yes. of. Yes. Uh, and many of them do, and many of them don't. <laughs> there are many Muslims that don't pay zakat anymore, but there are many that still do. Because now it's just a, it's an individual thing. There are many Muslims in my uh, area. There are, uh, you know, about 70,000 Muslims estimated in the Greater Bay Area. Maybe from that 70,000, 8 to 10,000 are actually praying. So, and from that 8 to 10,000 of those praying, there might not be some that are paying zakat. So, it's, it's now become more of an individual. I mean, do you think that's a fair estimate, Suleiman? Because yeah. you're more familiar with those type numbers than I am. Isn't it? I, I reason it's about 10% generally uh, within any given population in this country. Do you think that's accurate? Yeah, that's 
So, and Muslims often fall in very high tax brackets in this country because there's a lot of physicians, there's a lot of engineers, so they're paying a lot of taxes, right? Mm -hmm. oh, I in this category, in this iconic category, is that where you were planning to discuss uh, the idea of uh, lending an interest and paying interest in the that uh, That's it? another, I was going to do that with the Sharia, but I can bring that up now, the idea of just, um, yeah, let me just get through that, go ahead. Um, okay. Uh, no, lost it, I'll come back. Okay, sure. just when it comes back. Um, fasting is the next pillar and that's one lunar year out of the month called Ramadan. It will change. Now it's interesting also to note that the lunar year is basically, uh, it will make a full cycle. Uh, in other words, it will, uh, it will go through the, the solar year one time every th 32 years. So if a person average lifespan uh, is somewhere around 65, um, now it's a little higher in this country, but um, you're going to be fasting two times in all the months of the year. So Ramadan will be in December twice in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. Now it's very interesting because that's related to a kind of justice as well because of the different places on the earth. You will find that Ramadan, for some people it's, it's very long at a given part of the year and then other people's it's incredibly short. So in England, there are periods where it will be very long, and then there are periods where it will only be like, you know, f you know, seven hours, very short fast. And then in the middle part of the world, it's actually quite reasonable. It's usually around 12 hours if you're near the equator. So, the, you know, in the winter, they're very short days. In the summer, they're long days. Fasting is basically abstaining during the lunar month of Ramadan from uh, food, from drink, uh, including cigarettes, um, from taking anything past the throat. You can rinse your mouth and things, but anything past the throat breaks the fast. And from sexual, uh, f both foreplay and uh, actual full intercourse. So during the, the month of Ramadan, those things the Muslim is commanded to abstain from both men and women. In my school, which is the Maliki school, it's not encouraged for children to fast. It's actually discouraged. And uh, if they get older, like around 10, 11, then uh, they can fast if they want to. But it's not considered something that you should force a child to do. So, um, any questions? Fasting is pretty straightforward. Is there any? Mm -hmm. There have been some students at my school who, during Ramadan, even though they may have been sick and should have been drinking fluids, didn't. Uh, Muslims, you'll generally find, are pretty rigid about that and that has to do sometimes with not fully understanding the tradition because if you're diabetic it's actually prohibited to fast if a physician thinks that it's harmful it is prohibited by sharia and you would actually be doing something haram in the teaching you would be doing something prohibited because preservation of the self is the second after preservation of religion it is the second highest priority in the sharia could you go through the categories of those who are exempt, other than you said diabetics? Um, old people, if it's difficult for them. If they're able to, but it's hard, they, they have a choice. People who are traveling have a choice, but if it's hard, they, they're encouraged to break it. And if it's extremely hard, undo, then they have to break it. Um, a pregnant woman, a nursing woman, and she can either decide for herself or get a doctor's opinion. And the doctor's opinion would be binding on her. Anyone who has a physical illness, like diabetes, or they have to take medicines regularly throughout the day. Now some scholars have permitted like uh, asthma inhalers, inhalants, that that does not break the fast. There's a difference of opinion about that, but some, my sheikh gave a religious opinion that it did not break the fast because it went into the lungs. And smoking broke the fast because it was unnecessary, right? Which a smoker would definitely disagree with that. <laughs> soldiers, right? What's that? Uh, soldiers. Good point, yeah. Somebody who was uh, fighting, you know, and they needed their physical strength. Now, you know, Hakim Ali Jawan, um, it was, kind of became national news because 
he was fasting during the playoffs. And, uh, you know, it would be prohibited, really, for him to do that, to break his fast. You know, because it's a sport. That's why. If it was a valid job, like it is permissible, for instance, if there was a harvest that had to be done and they could not do it uh, fasting uh, and they would lose the crop or something like that because of that, some type of situation like that, then it would be actually permissible to do it. I mean, uh huh. What are the hours of fast? Fasting goes from the Fajr prayer, which is dawn, until the sunset prayer. And then you can eat, sleep, uh, and well, you do sleep in the daytime anyway, but you can eat, drink, and have uh, relations with uh, your, your husband or your wife. It's during the, di uh, the nighttime. Who could get married? During Ramadan? During Ramadan. You, could. you could, absolutely. Prophet got married in Ramadan. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Ramadan predates this story. The month predates Islam, not the fasting. But the month, the lunar months of Islam predated Islam. What predates Islam is the, uh, the rites around the Kaaba. During Ramadan? No. Ramadan does not predate Islam. Fasting in Ramadan is second year Hijrah. Before that, the Arabs did not fast. And the Quran says, fasting has been prescribed upon you just as it was prescribed upon the people before you in order that you might learn discipline. So it's actually considered a spiritual practice to discipline yourself. Now if you think about it, people who abstain from, uh, f for a whole month of not eating during the daylight hours, that is, it's, you know, it gives the body, there is a, a very strong discipline that goes with that. It's prohibited to backbite at any time. Whether it's a Muslim or a non-Muslim, you are not supposed to talk bad about um, people. It is prohibited to, um, to uh, lie. It's disencouraged to talk a lot empty talk in Islam. It's just not something encouraged. There's a tradition the Prophet said, كَرِهُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ الْقِيلَ وَالْقَالِ Allah dislikes empty gossip. You know. Thoreau said that gossip was good in homeopathic doses. <laughs> to head back to a question I'd forgotten earlier, you said if there were a legitimate Muslim government, then Zakat could be applied. And, um, and I know that a lot of Muslims think there is not, but there are governments that claim they are, right. correct? Have any of the current governments that claim to be Muslim governments Started to collect there's there's zakat there's some zakat absolutely in in the Emirates in Arabia uh -huh. in different places they do have zakat and people can pay it through government uh, can or not? no they don't have to okay. yeah but it's for, but but with it but with a legitimate Islamic government it would be allowed for that government to, to do it yes yeah to require mm -hmm. okay. but nowhere requires a currency no okay. Could you explain that why Ramadan? Is it when the angel Gabriel? Okay, good point. Thank you. Yeah. Reveal. It's, uh -huh. it's Ramadan. The reason Ramadan uh, is the month of fasting is generally uh, it says that this Quran was revealed in, in, in you know, a blessed time. Shahar Ramadan, alladhi unzira fihi al Quran. The month of Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed. Now, the Muslim belief is that the Qur'an came to the first heaven, which is called Sama'ud Dunya, to, to a place called Baytul Izza, the abode of dignity or exaltation. And then from, and that happened in Ramadan. And the beginning of the revelation began on the 27th of Ramadan. And then over a 23 year period, it is being revealed to the Prophet. And in Ramadan specifically, the Prophet ﷺ said that that Jibreel used to go through the Quran every month with him, but in Ramadan, uh, he used to go through it every year with him in Ramadan, the entire Quran. And then in the last Ramadan of his life, he went through it two times, and he knew that that was his last year. So the Ramadan is considered a very blessed time for Muslims. And traditionally, it's encouraged for people to go out and see the new moon, and uh, 
you know, the, the Muslims uh, traditionally went out, sighted the new moon, and you would hear a lot of shouts of joy, Allahu Akbar, um, in the Muslim cities that go up on the rooftops and things. Mm -hmm. Is there, therefore, a connection between the crescent and the star? The crescent moon, interestingly enough, is a much later. Um, it was the, the Mamluks that actually introduced the crescent moon. And I think it actually, you know, it was a symbol of uh, some of the ancient moon cults. Um, it's become to be adopted as a, a symbol, but it's in no way an authoritative symbol of Islam. Um, I mean, Muslims, it's like an urf, what they call a custom. And the Prophet said, whatever the Muslims see as good, um, is good with Allah. So there's an idea that the crescent moon has kind of been accepted by the Muslims as, but it's not from the Prophet Muhammad. It's an interesting thing about Islam is the absence of symbols, like icons and things. There, there really is. You go into a mosque and calligraphy is pretty much, and then you have a lot of geometric, uh, which is later. But, but there is a, there's a real, uh, there's just an absence of a type of icon iconography or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I've heard it said that the Shahada is a symbol for Islam, written on. <coughs> somebody said that. Um, it's, it's traditionally the Prophet did put it on his flag. Yeah. And so uh, it, it traditionally has been like, but again, when I mean symbol, I mean more like an abstract, not so much language. Language is symbols, obviously, but I'm, I mean like a cross or the Star of David or uh, the, the Om Simbu statues. You know, in, in traditions, you have a lot of symbols. Like Hindu tradition has many, many symbols. Um, you know, the Christians have the Stations of the Cross. In a lot of Catholic churches, you'll, you'll see those type things. So finally, uh, Hajj. Now, just about the fasting, I would say that traditionally the Muslims viewed fasting as um, a time of discipline. You should control your talk, your speech, not talk a lot. Learn to control the sexual appetite. Uh, learn to control the tongue. It was very important. The Prophet said in a tradition, whoever guarantees for me what's between his two jaws and his two thighs, I guarantee him paradise. In other words, if you could discipline, if you could break those two desires and really discipline yourself in those two things, then, you know. And it's interesting the symbolic relationship between the mouth and the genitals. I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating. There's been a lot of traditions that have examined that. The idea of the createdness that the the mouth is like a womb, and the tongue is, is, is like, uh, you know, is, is like um, the, a male organ. That there's a type of, that language is a type of created, uh, it, you know, it's an aspect of creativity. Um, there's an impregnation that takes place with, from the mind of thought that emerges in the child of speech and things like that. So there, there, there's some fascinating relationships there. Um, let's see. Hajj. Hajj, the, the pillar of Hajj is the fifth pillar, and I think it's really wonderful uh, to me that of all the pillars of Islam, even though all of these pillars are based on ability, zakat, if, you can't, if you're not able to pay it, you don't pay it. Fasting, if you're not able to fast, you don't fast. Even the prayer, if you're not able to pray standing, you pray reclining. If you're not able to pray reclining, you pay... Um, just with your eyes. If you're not able to do that, you pray in your, uh, in your consciousness. If you're not able to do that, you don't have to pray. But yet, the Hajj is the only one in the Quran where it says, لِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حَجُّ الْبَيْتِ لِمَنْ اسْتَطَعِ إِلَيْهِ السَّبِيلَ Allah, it is incumbent upon mankind or humankind the pilgrimage to His house for whoever is able to make the journey. Even though all the other ones are, it's the same stipulation, but in that one, the stipulation is mentioned. And I think part of that is because the vast majority of Muslims will never be able to make the Hajj. And so it's kind of like just the fact that it was mentioned in there, that they, there's kind of an ease with that. And this is why the example that you made about people fasting, even though they don't have to, they, they'll still do it. You know, really. Whereas the Hajj, there is definitely a limitation there related to wealth, physical p capacity borders even now. You know, for some people they can't, like for a long time the Russian Muslims could not make pilgrimage. The communist government would not let them make pilgrimage. So there's limitations and yet right there in the Quran it says, for whoever is able to do it, the vast majority of Muslims will never do that. If you look, there's about one billion estimated Muslims. Every year the maximum I could imagine 
pilgrim as being is maybe four million people. Right now it reaches about three million. Um, and you, you are packed. You're, you're like this, doing some of the rites. There's so many people. And it's very interesting. I, you know, I've made pilgrimage three times, and I've made Umrah several times. But the actual pilgrimage, I mean, first thing, it's, it's related to the ritual of Abraham. The, the Muslims believe that Abraham uh, took his son, Ishmael, to the valley of Bekkah or Mecca. It's also called Bekkah in the Quran, Mecca and Bekkah. And he was commanded to leave his uh, maidservant, Hajar, and Ishmael in that place. It's a barren place. And then he left them. There's, uh, the, what the tradition says is that Hajar, who was uh, from, she was an African woman, uh, who was a mother of Ishmael, that she began, began, went into a state of anxiety about the place, because there was no water, nothing. And she began to run between these two uh, hills, Safa and Marwa. And she did that seven times, worrying about her baby. And on the seventh time, the well of Zemzem uh, emerged. And there's a well there that still to this day feeds the, the pilgrims of Mecca. And she drank from the well, and then some people there uh, who were passing through uh, helped them, and they become established. And Abraham comes back when Ishmael is becoming a man and builds with him the house in Mecca. This is what the tradition says. Builds with him the Kaaba. Now some say that the Kaaba was first built by Adam, uh, salam. And some say that Adam and Hawa met on the plain of Arafah, which is the word Arafah means to recognize. And it's where they recognize each other after the garden on the earth. Allah Ta'ala Allah knows best about those things. But the, the basic idea is that the Kaaba was the, the first house established for the worship of one God only. And Ibrahim built the house, and it's a, it's a cube, very simple structure. Um, nothing there and then the rites that are related to it is you you enter into a ritual state which is called ihram for a woman it's taking a bath and dressing in her normal dress women tend to wear white on the hajj they don't have to but they tend to just as a tradition the man enters into uh, what's called ihram which is two pieces of cloth a loin cloth and then a cloth over him. It can have no stitching. It's woven, but it cannot have stitching by hand. <coughs> because you're supposed to completely, it's like, it represents complete uh, impoverishment before God. And everybody has to be the same. And so it's encouraged that everybody looks the same. The rich man, the poor man, the free man, the bondsman, everybody, the king, the, the, the pauper, everybody becomes the same. And that's the idea, that humanity before God is equal. There's absolutely no differences. And so even in clothes, a rich man, you cannot wear rings. You cannot wear any display of, of worldly uh, wealth. So somebody who normally wears jewelry, they have to take it all off. So every, you wouldn't know, you see a person, you don't know if they're rich, they're poor, you don't, you don't have a clue. They just look the same as you do. And so the idea is literally, that humanity completely strips themselves of any of their social uh, accruement, social status. And they go there before God equal. And the first ritual is you enter into the, the place of Mecca and you go to the house and you do a circumambulation seven times. You go around the house seven times, which according to the tradition is what Ibrahim did. And then the Prophet ﷺ purified and renewed it again. So, after going around the house, you will kiss the black stone. The black stone is a stone that's been identified as, as a meteorite, but traditionally it was believed that, that it came from heaven, and originally it was white and became black from the wrong actions of people that touched it. And you go and you kiss the stone, and the Prophet said the stone is the, it's like the right, uh, it's, it's like the right hand of God. On the, in other words, a symbolic, like you go and kiss the hand of the, the king or the pope for the Catholics, they would kiss the ring. That there you go and you kiss the stone as a symbol of being invited to the house of the king. And you kiss the stone and then you pray two rakats or two prostrations at the place of Ibrahim. It's called Maqamu Ibrahim, where Abraham built uh, the house. 
and there is an actual place, a maqam, and there are two footprints in there that are traditionally considered to be the footprints of Abraham. And then, at that point you go, you drink from the well of Zamzam, and you make prayer. It's a good place to make prayer. And then you go to Safa and Marwa, and you go between them seven times. And there's a period where you actually do a, a, a quick run. It's not, not a sprint, but like a jog, uh, which symbolizes Hajar's running through that uh, area. And then at, after the seventh time you've completed that, you go to Mina. And Mina is a place where you prepare for Arafat. So you clean yourself again, you, and then the next morning you set out for Arafat. You will spend the day at Arafat. It's a plain that is considered to be a preparation for the Day of Judgment. You're literally preparing for the day when all of humanity is before God. In a nonlinear sense, no front, back, right? It's not anthropomorphic, but is before God and goes naked, stripped of all of their worldly uh, distinctions, and you ask for forgiveness. And so the prayer of Arafat is to ask forgiveness of God to come, it's very powerful because you are literally seeing humanity there. I mean, it, I've, you know, I've been to the Vatican at times when there's a lot of people. I've, I haven't been to any of these Hindu gatherings, but I've never seen anything like it in, in the sense that literally there are Chinese people, there are Indonesians, there are Malay people, there are African people, there are black Africans, there are white Africans. There are Turkic people, there are European people, now there are American people, there are Mongolians, there are Chinese from uh, different places in China, there are Cambodians, there are Thai people, Vietnamese people, Filipino people, people literally coming. It says in the Quran they will come from every deep crevice, they will come from every valley, and they will come to this place, and they're all there. You just see the whole thing. You see sick people, you see healthy people, you see people crawling, you see people being carried. <coughs> Some people literally carry other people on their backs. You see people carrying their parents. So it's, it's just a very, very overwhelming experience to, to enter into that sacred space. And the great reminder on that day, the, the verse that was quoted when the Prophet made Hajj, there was a black man who, who gave the Adhan. And the Arabs looked down on, you know, they had this uh, racism, and they, they looked down on it and they said, you know, they asked why that man was giving the call to prayer. And so the verse came down that um, we have created you in, in peoples and tribes to, <laughs> to know one another. So the idea is people come there really to, to learn. It's a little difficult. I'm just, <laughs> I'm kind of getting back into that um, space. So just excuse me for a second. Hajj, for some reason, I just have a hard time talking about it because I've been there, you know, and I've had the experience, and it just, they start coming back to me, that experience in that place, but, uh, so I'll just try to get over this. Um, the, the verse just said that, you know, we have created you in peoples and tribes to know one another, and it says the noblest in the eyes of God are the most conscientious. In other words, the, and the one thing that the Prophet said on the Hajj pilgrimage was there is no preference over a white man or a black man or a black man over a white man. So the idea is just to eliminate this, this, uh, you know, this insidious aspect of human uh, nature, which is the idea that some people are superior to others. <coughs> and when you see everybody in that same condition, you know, the, the nomad and the sedentary, the rich and the poor, and they're all just there in that same basic human condition, that we are bereft and we are poor before God, it's very powerful to, as a reminder you know, that beware of considering yourself above this person next to you because of something incidental like color or because of something like wealth or because of something like beauty or because of something like lineage. That in that place, all of those things disappear and you're just like everybody else. You are a 
a naked creature that has to eat, sleep, and, and defecate, and urinate, and menstruate, and procreate, and do all these things, and there's something very basic and fundamental to your humanity. So the, the Hajj really does, and what I've noticed with people who make the Hajj is there is often a very powerful transformation that occurs in their life. It really is a very transformative experience. You are not the same person. You don't look at other people the same way, and uh, th there's just a transformation. And traditionally they said if a person comes back worse from Hajj, bad sign. <laughs> <laughs> They said he, either he went there with the wrong intention or it just it wasn't accepted for whatever reason. So the idea is that Hajj is really a time when you complete it, uh, that you, uh, you know, it's, it's your life's journey and you're ready to die. And that really is a kind of completion. So those are the five pillars and that's a very quick and general overview. So what time is it now? Oh, it's quarter after 12? So I went over. We started late. <laughs> now, you can't do that when there's bells and things, right? <laughs> so I'll just, any quick questions? Uh-huh. How long is the Hajj? The Hajj only lasts for four days. Four. Yeah, and it's actually three, and then there's the last. Uh -huh. Can you explain the part of the Hajj where they throw stones? Good, yeah, I forgot about that. There is a point where according to Abraham, uh, the tradition, Abraham was, was like tempted by Satan or Shaitan, and he, he cast stones. And the idea, I mean, the Muslims believe in a, an entity called Iblis, which is where we get Diablo, Diablos, and, and, uh, or Shaitan. And Shaitan in Arabic means from Shaitana, which means to uh, take people away from or to distance people and the idea is that there is an entity th whose role and function is to attempt to distance people from God, to separate them from God and there, there are two types of uh, shayateen, there are human ones and there are ones that are uh, uh, in the unseen realm the human ones according to the prophet are worse right, human, like p warmongers, people like that, you know people that they, they thrive off, off uh, creating, you know, there's actually people that will want to create wars between other people. It's kind of hard to imagine, but, you know, there's people that <coughs> make a lot of money doing things like that, and they get, drive a lot of benefits. So, and, and it's also, I mean, I really consider in a lot of ways, there's a lot of people with, you know, I read this thing called Ad Week, which is really, you know, I would really recommend if you're teaching any so, social studies or sociology type courses, to get your students to read that magazine because I think it really wakes them up to the, the idea of manipulation within their culture. Uh, the fact that there are people manipulating them at very serious and psychological levels. And Ad Week is, is a magazine that you can't, it's very hard to find in your average store. You can get it at very good, um, you know, places where they have almost all the magazines. Uh, and, and it's a magazine designed for people who are advertisers. It's not a consumer magazine, it's designed for people. And the, the, the interesting thing about the magazine is that the commodity being sold is human beings. That's what's so fascinating. When they, when they put the ads out, what they're trying to sell you is an audience. And they'll guarantee you a certain percentage of sales from that audience. And they really bring really interesting things. Like they had one where last, uh, last month's ad week where they, and I'm interested, just because I'm very interested in media and in, I'm interested in education, I really think that the media has been very effective at educating people in a certain way. Um, but they had one that said that the uh, recent study that they did, the psychologists showed that, uh, that American men, that their number one fantasy, sexual fantasy, was with nurses. And what they said was that this was very uh, useful for advertisers because they could have like a beer commercial where a nurse comes in with a beer and the man's in the bed and they don't have to do anything overt. But for that group out there that happens to th think that that would be an interesting uh, thing to explore, there, there would be a type of what they call anchoring uh, in the subconscious, right? And so there's a sexual stimulation related to that type of beer. And this is the type of thing, I mean, they really do this stuff, you know, this type of research. And I think to just empower young people, to let them know that really that there are forces out there that, that, <coughs> that do try to manipulate them 
for their own good and to kind of become aware of that so that they're not such victims that they kind of get a type of critical analysis. Another really useful book was a PhD dissertation done and I can't remember her name but it's called Decoding Advertisements which is a lot about and it's not there's some real crazy type about a lot of the real you know sub, subliminal type things that I think go, go a little too far. You know, they start reading things in that just aren't there. But these are more done at, at you know, they're, they're academic. This is a very serious academic study of trying to understand really what's behind the whole ideology of advertisement. So, any other questions? Uh -huh. you just, oh, could you just tell when they... they oh, so what, thank you, I got off. I'm a tangent, go off on these tangents. What you do is you pick up um, these stones, 21 stones, and then you throw seven stones at these three pillars. And it's a purely symbolic thing. And unfortunately, some of these hajis get a little out of hand and they start thinking that really is the devil. Right? So you get some stones. And there was a hadith in which a man was throwing big stones and the prophet said, beware of going to extremes in your religion. The prophet actually hated extremism. He really did. He did not like, he was very wary of extremes. He was a very balanced person. He, he, he said, my way is the middle way. He did not like um, people that were fasting all the time. He said, I eat and I fast. He, he did not like people who abstained from sexual relations. He said, I have sexual relations. He did not like people that stayed up all night. He said, I pray and I sleep. So he really was very wary. He, he saw one time there was a rope in the mosque tied to the wall and he asked what it was and he said so and so put that for when they fell asleep that it would keep them up and he said take it down and tell them not to do that he saw another man who swore that he would stay in the sun until such and such happened and he would fa and the, the prophet told him said tell him to get out of the sun you know and just uh, finish his fast for the day but not to go into the sun so he was very against extremes and so you're supposed to pick up very small pebbles and literally just throw them like this it's not supposed to be like, whoosh, you know. So people take sandals and throw. I mean, it gets a little crazy. The, the, the throwing is, is actually probably the hardest part of the Hajj because people do get a little out of control. And then you're dealing with a lot of, you know, unfortunately the, from the Muslim world, you're getting a lot of uh, people coming out of very ignorant backgrounds. A lot of them don't know their tradition. They haven't learned the rules of Hajj. So you, you, you have a lot of things. But, it's amazing, given the amount of people, given the space, given the intensity, there are very, very rarely any incidents of, I mean, there's, I have never heard of any violent, outright violent incidences where people actually, um, other than I think there were some riots uh, that the Iranians during the whole Iranian revolution did. But my three times on the Hajj, if somebody starts getting angry, there's all these people around them just tell them, you know, be patient, you're, you're on Hajj, you know, and they remind them and things like that. And, and people respond to that. And the same is true in Ramadan. You know, you're fasting, you know, just relax and calm down. Can you explain that feast at the end? It symbolizes the, that Abraham, السلام, that when he was told to kill his son, um, what the Jewish tradition calls the Akita tradition, that he, uh, it was replaced with a ram. And there's a difference of opinion in the Muslim tradition, whether it was Isaac or Ishmael. Um, the, the, you know, I think most Muslims now believe that it was Ishmael, but early on the, the Prophet never said which child it was. And it's, and it's not really considered important to the, it's not essential to the story. The importance is the act of submission. And um, you, what you do is you celebrate the, by sacrificing uh, a ram, preferably, or some other animal, and then distribute that uh, meat to poor people and things like that. Mm -hmm. And other Muslims take part in that around the world. Even though the hajis are doing it, other Muslims like in Santa Clara, people will go out and they will sacrifice on that day. Many people, and it's encouraged to do that. <laughs> Any other? So, I think that, that ends the uh, session on Islam, and I hope that was beneficial, and thanks for your attention.